John chapter 8 and 9 is where we'll be this morning as we continue in this series. My dad was a tobacco auctioneer, and so if you ever wonder why I talk fast at times, that's maybe why. Um, If you've asked me to auction, I cannot, but I grew up with my dad being in a a tobacco warehouse and auctioning off tobacco, and I actually would travel with my dad during the winter seasons, and we would go to Kentucky, and we would go to Tennessee, and I would love to just see how, you know, they cured tobacco there, and then how the whole process there was a little bit different than here in eastern North Carolina, but I um, love to go with him, and so one of these trips he, we took a couple of days to just kind of hang out in the mountains of Tennessee in the Great Smoky Mountains, and he found this place. It was called the Lost Sea, the Lost Sea. And the Lost Sea is you get on and you walk into this cave, and they take you in this massive elevator shaft, and they take you down below this cave, and there's actually uh, the, one of the world's largest underground lakes in the Great Smoky Mountains is called the Lost Sea. So you can, you can walk through it and you can see there's, there's actually fish that live under there. I forget how many hundreds of feet that were under, under the ground. And it's, it's pretty fascinating. There's a, even a part where you can get on a boat and you can travel around. The guide will shine light and show you all the wildlife that's living under there, the marine life that's living under there. And the part that surprised me was, first of all, you're, you're really low in the ground. And they have lights everywhere. And there was this one part on the tour when we're off the boat and we're walking and there's there's this rail. He says, okay, I want you all to hang on the rail and don't let go. And he turns off, the guide has all the lights of the cave turned off. And I remember this feeling of just being swallowed up by darkness. He said, put your hand in front of your face. You could put your hand in front of your face. You could not see it. I couldn't tell if I was upside down or right side up or what was left or right. So I took a picture of that moment. That's what it looked like. Um, Just kidding. That's not a real picture, but that's, that's what it felt like. I felt like I was literally just swallowed up uh, by the darkness. And I remember just grabbing hold of my dad. I'm like, you know, if the lights don't come back on, you feel this sense of uh, angst of what's going to happen next. And I remember he pulled out a flashlight, the guide, and he shined the flashlight. And then there was a sense of like, wow, and relief. And I'm amazed at just how dark it was. And just like one flashlight can do, it would just literally, it would seemingly push back the darkness all around us. And then when the lights finally came on, you felt, you even heard the, oh, you know, the gasp and the crowd of like, okay, this is not going to feel this way forever, right? And so Jesus, he calls himself the light of the world. He says, I am the light of of the world. What does he mean when he says this? That the light of the world would come in the darkness. In fact, John's gospel, it opens up with Jesus or John saying that this is what Jesus was, the light of the world. In fact, I'll just read it for you. John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word, he's, he's going to say later, is Jesus. He says in verse 18, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So in the beginning was Jesus. And, and Jesus, the word, was with God, and the word was God, and he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him, in Christ, he says, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and, and here's good news, the darkness has not overcome it. So John uses this metaphor of light to describe Jesus Christ coming into the world. And Jesus himself uses the same metaphor of himself coming into the world. Now, even if you didn't grow up in church, even if you didn't hear about Jesus growing up, there's still a metaphor of light and darkness. And light and darkness is often the metaphor of good and evil. If you've ever watched Star Wars, what's the bad guys called? The dark side, right? We look at Darth Vader. He's, all, he's dressed in all black. It's to represent this sense of wickedness or evil. But the scriptures say that here you have a world that is full of darkness and what changes in human histories when Christ comes in and the metaphor that is used is that he is the light 
of the world. And so the question is, what does that mean for us this morning? Uh, how, does that, how should that change the way that we see Christ? How should that change the way that we see ourselves, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world? That's what we're going to unpack this morning, beginning in John chapter 8. Now, in John chapter 8, starting in verse 12, we don't know exactly uh, what happened before. We know that Jesus is, is in the temple, and he's teaching uh, 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 Jews who are listening, and there's a group of Pharisees that are there, along with his disciples, and the Pharisees. Pharisees are beginning to question uh, what Jesus had said. We know in chapter 7 of John, uh, John is seen uh, teaching in the temple again, and we don't know if this is the next day or some hours later. We're not exactly sure, but we know Jesus is there. He's teaching in the temple, and I want you to see what he says. Verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am, here's the I am statement, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, right away, what do we learn about light? Well, he says light is life. And anyone who's stuck in the darkness, he represents that as death. And so he's saying this uh, to a group of Jews in the temple with the Pharisees there. The Pharisees are beginning to question. And what happens next kind of unpacks what Jesus means by this and why this is such a significant statement. Look in verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and I know where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And even yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For if I'm not alone, for, if, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where's your father? And Jesus said, you know neither me nor my father. If, I, if you knew me, you would know my father also. Then John says, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one uh, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Now, I want you to imagine Jesus is here in the temple. He's making these statements, and the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they began to argue with Jesus, and Jesus is holding the line, right? And I don't know if you picked up on this, but if Jesus is not God, he sounds like a pretty arrogant person, does he not? Because if Jesus is not God, these are blasphemous statements, especially to the Jews. And this is why the Pharisees, they began to debate with him here. And they're going to debate with him all the way to the end of chapter 8, to where they're so angry with him at the end of chapter 8, they're ready to kill him right there in the temple. That's how angry they are. And here's why what Jesus said was so offensive. For Jesus to proclaim that he is the light of the world would be something that the Jews would have been highly familiar with. Because here's the thing, uh, I said this last week, one of the things that the Jews would attach to and their identity was often wrapped up in was the Exodus, was when God brought his people through Moses, the leader, brought them out of captivity and hopefully to the promised land. And there were multiple times where God's people were out in the desert and they're trying to trust God. God, when are we going to get food? Uh, when are we going to get water? And they would, God would literally rain down manna from heaven. One time they were thirsty, Moses hits a rock with a, a staff and the rock uh, burst out a whole bunch of water for them to drink. And all of these things were God's provision. But you know how they knew knew that God was always with them and that God was always guiding them. Well, there was a cloud by day that they would have to follow. So I don't know if this looked like a Super Mario cloud where it's up in the air and it's moving and they have to go and follow it wherever they are. And then, so I'm trying to imagine what that would be like a cloud by day, but you know how they would know that God was with them at night in the darkness was a pillar of fire, a pillar of light. And so they would see this as the ongoing presence of God who was with them. Furthermore, you have several hundred years later 
when um, the prophet Isaiah, he speaks of the Messiah to come, the one who would save the world. Look at what he says in Isaiah 43. He says, I am the Lord. I have called you into righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you a covenant for the people. Look at what he says. A what? A light. A light to the nations. To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and from the prison, those who sit in the darkness. So what does Isaiah say about the coming Messiah? What is Isaiah saying about who Jesus would be? He said he would be in light to not just our people, but for the nations, and that he would cause the blind to see. That's good news, church. This is what he's saying he'll do. And so the Pharisees knew this. The Jews who were there in the temple, they knew this. And Jesus is going, yep, I am the light of the world. All the things that Isaiah t- spoke about, um, all the things that you, heard, you heard about in your history with this pillar of fire at night, the ongoing presence of God, the light that the people would follow. He goes, yep, that's me. So can you imagine? They're pretty frustrated right here. And so the Pharisees are like, well, well who told you that that's you? You can't just say that. In fact, even in their own law, in the Old Covenant, you needed two witnesses to say something on this level of authority. In fact, you even see Jesus. He points this out in verse 17 of John 8. He says, In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. And so for this, through a person to proclaim something of God, they have to have two witnesses that would validate, yes, this actually is coming from God. So you can imagine their frustration. He's saying things that only God can say. He's saying everything that you've heard about in the prophets, everything you've heard about in your stories, about um, this light that would come, that's me. And they're saying, who do you think you are? What gives you the right? Who do you think you are to make this statement? Now, I don't know if you've ever watched um, these YouTube videos where people get caught with something called stolen valor. Have you ever seen these videos? Where it's like these guys that they are pretending to be in military service by dressing up. They'll find like camouflage pants and a camouflage jacket. And they're like, I serve in the military. And they're trying to get discounts on food and coffee. Anybody ever seen these? And so what always happens or what often happens is they're walking around with these fatigues on and then someone who is either a veteran or someone who really is in military service, they see them and go, that doesn't look right. Like what they're wearing, it doesn't match up. Uh, the, the way the patches are arranged, the way their boots are, that's not right. And so they begin to go up to them and they confront them. They have their phone out and they confront them. And they're like, hey, what, what branch of the military are you in? What, okay, what unit were you in? And they begin to kind of like catch that they are lying. They're not being honest. And so it's, it's funny, and this is where the, the funny part is, even though it's messed up how they're doing it when they get caught. Because the real guys are like, stolen valor! These people are like, And then everybody starts to boo them, right? And they begin to go, okay, is this me that this thinks is funny? Anyone else, right? Um, and so they begin to kind of expose that these guys are not legit. And so this is kind of what it's like for the Pharisees. They're like, okay, you're saying you're God. Who did you come from? Like, tell me your credentials. Where are you from again, Jesus? A Nazar, Nazar, Nazareth, never heard of it. Uh, who's your dad again? Oh, he's a carpenter. Oh, that not, doesn't sound great. He wasn't a religious leader like the rest of us. Uh, who's your mom again? Oh, yeah, your mom. She was that, like, teenage girl that said she was a virgin but also pregnant. That doesn't make sense. So, yeah, this is not looking good for you, Jesus. So we don't see that you're being honest with us. We don't really trust your, your story. And Jesus, the equivalent of what Jesus is doing is like, yeah, I know that I'm not showing up the way that you want me to. I know you think I've got stolen valor, but listen, I know the president. Uh, In fact, and the other witness is me. And Jesus is saying the same thing. Hey, I know I'm not showing up in the glamorous ways that you thought the Messiah would come, but can I just tell you that I don't need a witness. I have my own witness. I have my own authority. Can I also tell you that I know the Father, and the Father sent me? And they're like, okay, don't believe you, right? So can you feel the tension a little bit around the Pharisees doubting Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to get you to side with the Pharisees here, all right? But I'm just showing you this tension because there's another side of the coin that's also true. Yes, Jesus doesn't show up in the way they thought. Jesus is saying these statements that I'm my own authority and God the Father sent me. 
And at the same time, Jesus also performed all these incredible miracles to prove that he was, in fact, from the Father. Uh, Just earlier in chapter 7, Jesus is in the same temple likely teaching about things of God, and they marvel because they never heard anyone speak this way. Uh, Chapter 6, we just unpacked it last week. What happens? Jesus takes five loaves and two fish, and he feeds almost 20,000 people. And so you look at this and you go, how do you not believe, guys? Like, okay, he's not showing up in the way that you do. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. He, has this, he speaks of his own authority and he, he has God the Father who sent him. But, but literally, how do you see a, a group of people, honestly, and it's crazy, right? You have 20,000 maybe people um, eating the, having their full of fish and loaves, this miracle that happened. But how many people are there at the cross with Jesus? How many people are there after when the church is established? 120. So you see the crowd begin to dwindle over time. You see people begin to doubt over time. How do you doubt when you see these miracles? I often wonder that. You ever wonder that reading the Bible? How is it possible? How is it possible that the Pharisees are even questioning Jesus after knowing and seeing the things that they've, they've witnessed? Well, what happens in the next chapter is showing us, is going to show us how they missed it. And honestly, what happens in the next chapter is going to show us how many of us still miss it today. Chapter 8, it ends with the Pharisees. They continue to debate with Jesus. And as they continue to debate with Jesus, their hostility begins to rise. So much so that ready to kill him right there in the temple. Jesus, chapter 8 ends with Jesus and his disciples. They're leaving the temple. And as they're leaving the temple, you're going to see them pass by a man who was blind. In verse 9, it says this. And as he passed by, I'm sorry, chapter 9, verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And the disciples asked him, Rabbi, which means teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And so most people, most scholars, they read this and unpack what's happening here. Most scholars assume that this blind man is sitting outside the temple and begging for money. Most scholars assume that he's there because he's hoping that people, the Jews who are going to the temple to worship, would be compelled to give to this man. And as Jesus and his disciples are escaping the wrath of the Pharisees, the disciples see this man and they stop and they ask a theological question. Not what this man, what does he need? But they begin to ask this question of what happened? Uh, What took place for this man to be in this condition? Who sinned? Was it he or was his parents that caused him to be blind? Now, generally speaking, this isn't a bad question. Maybe bad timing, maybe bad tact, but it's not a bad question. Because God's word teaches us that all brokenness um, in the world is a result of sin. And all of us, before we are born, we're born with the uh, curse of sin because of sin in the world. And none of us are perfect. That's why we need a Savior. But specifically to this situation, the disciples are wrong in asking this question. Because it was a wrong view of God that caused them to ask this question. Uh, many people in that culture believed that if something was, that you had a disability, that it must mean that God is either angry at you because of something that you've done or angry at your parents because of something that they've done. Like a generational curse because of sin that's happened in your family. And so you even see this show up with Abraham and Sarah on the, or in the Old Testament. They can't have a child, and there's a lot of shame around that, and people would often wonder, uh, wonder what they did for God not to bless them with a child. You even see Job. Job is there, and he's gone through tremendous loss of, of people and possessions, everything. He's lost, and Job's friends show up, and they ask him, hey, Job, what did you do to make God this angry at you? And sometimes this view of God, it even still rests today. Where sometimes we think, okay, if something bad has happened to me, it must be something that I've done that God is angry at me. Friends, I've got to tell you, that is not a biblical view of God. It was not then and it is not now. Because sometimes we go, well, if, if something happened to this person, it must be because of something I've done. Now, there are consequences to sin, absolutely. Uh, marriages and relationships are broken as a result of sin. Uh, people get hurt and wounded as a result of sin, absolutely. But just because something hard happens to you doesn't mean that God is against you and is punishing you. And that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came and he said, I did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. 
So you have the disciples that are asking Jesus this theological question that many wondered that day about this blind man. And I love what Jesus does here. He takes their question and he gives them a demonstration of his goodness. It says in verse 3, Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but, listen to this, that the works of God might be displayed in him. So why does he have this? He's saying, so that I will show off my goodness. Even in the pain, um, even in his disability, I'm going to show off my goodness. I'm amazed by this verse because Jesus is saying, while you're sitting here wondering about this theological question of the problem of evil, how could this happen to this poor guy, I'm about to show you that I'm going to take this man's disability and I'm going to use it for my glory. That's the God we serve, church. And sometimes we wonder when we encounter people who have suffered or when we suffer, we go, how could a loving God do this? And Jesus here is going, listen, I know it's hard. I know it's painful. I know it's confusing. But just wait. That I'm going to show you something, even in the midst of this chaos, even in the midst of this pain, even in the midst of this hurt. And church, one thing I know for sure about pain and suffering is that God is sovereign and good simultaneously. That God has a purpose for those who are in Christ who are suffering. And if you're in a season of suffering right now, I want to promise you if you're in Christ, God has a purpose for it. Romans 8.28 says, We know that those who, are, who love God, all things work together for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So if you have pain in your life, rest in this. He's both sovereign and good. He promises to use what is difficult in your life, in your story, past, present, and future, to use it for your good so that you would enjoy Christ and for his glory so that he would show off his goodness and grace. And somehow he would take what is there and he will make it perfect. And we don't know when and we don't know how, but we know that he will. And that's what's about to happen to this blind man. Verse 4, he says, We must work the works of him who sent me. <clears throat> Excuse me, I lost my place. <laughs> we must work with the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with saliva. And then he anointed the man's eye with the mud, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And so he went and washed and came back seeing. Church, this is the Christ. This is the God that we serve, the God who makes the blind see. And I love this because it begins, the disciples are asking Jesus this theological question, and Jesus does two things with it. He teaches his disciples, and then he demonstrates compassion on the blind man. He, he's where theology meets um, application, that he's not just going to teach his disciples, though. He's teaching all of us. That's really the message for all of us. I hope you can see this. He's showing us this is the way that Christ is toward those who are hurting this is one who brings light in the darkness. Now, that's the immediate context, but there's a greater context that this story rests in. Because you remember the last chapter. Chapter 8 was the very first time that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And the second time Jesus says, I am the light of the world, is right here with the blind man. So what is happening? Thank you for asking. You're really quiet today. So, Jesus said, the first time, I am the light of the world, in front of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees didn't believe it. And then we wondered how they could not believe it, right? All these miracles, all these signs, how do you not believe it? And then Jesus said the second time, right before he heals a blind man. So you, you see this greater context, and you wonder, why is it the Pharisees didn't believe? Here's why. Because they too were blind. They could not see Jesus. And Jesus even said, you cannot see the Father because you can't see me. So they are blinded 
spiritually blinded toward the things of God. Now, I want to tell you this right out of the gate. The Pharisees would have been really great church attenders that they were around today. The Pharisees knew the Torah. They knew the first five books of the Old Testament. They knew how to quote what the Torah was. They knew how to quote the law. In fact, so many times when they're engaging the disciples, when they're engaging Jesus, they would quote the law. They would misquote the law often. But when Jesus is standing there right in front of him, the word that became flesh is standing them right in front of him. God, who's in the form of man, standing right in front of him. They did not know him, and they did not believe him. Why? Because they were spiritually blinded toward the things of God. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of people in the South, Bible Belt, go to church, they read the Bible, they know the songs, they, they listen to Caleb, they know all the right things, but can be spiritually blinded. It's very possible, and it happens all the time. Because they'll base their whole theology on, well, I prayed a prayer when I was young, I made a, I made a decision. But when it comes to the things of God, they're calloused, their hearts are not open, their hearts are not softened toward the things of God. Uh, they might be stuck in sin and continue in a pattern of sin with no real, genuine life change. There's no movement. There's no sensitivity toward the Holy Spirit. There's no compassion toward the people around them. And that's exactly the condition of the Pharisees. And oftentimes, God in the Old Testament, he would blind his enemies because it would be an example of the condition of their heart because it was to show them that they were spiritually blind. Even if you think back to the story in Acts, where you have the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was um, the first real missionary that went out to the nations to spread the gospel to the non-Jews. And before Paul was Paul, his name was Saul. And Saul was a hater of the church, a hater of Christianity. He spent much of his time trying to stop the spread of Christianity by traveling around and finding people in their homes worshiping Jesus and capturing them and sending them to prison, some even to be martyred. And here's Paul, and he's on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 8. And as he's walking with his friends that are all there to help him reduce the spread of Christianity, he hears a voice from God, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In other words, why are you sinning against me? Why are you blaspheming my name? And Saul is stopped dead in his tracks. He falls down and he asks, who is this voice? And he says, I'm Jesus who you are persecuting. And in that very moment, Saul is humbled, but guess what? To show God, to show him his heart condition, God makes Saul blind for three days where he cannot see. And then later, the scriptures tell us in Acts chapter 8 that when he received his sight, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And look at what it says in verse, nine, uh, verse 18 in Acts 9. It says, And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained sight, and he rose and was baptized. What happened to Saul, who was once a hater of God and a hater of Christianity, God used his physical blindness to show him that he was spiritually blind, that he was spiritually in the dark. And the text says that something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Church, that is what happens when a person meets Christ. They're dead toward the things of God. But when they're met with Christ and Jesus meets them and speaks to them and softens their heart, all of a sudden they, there's life. And when there's life, there's light. They can see. They can see the things of God. They're sensitive to the things of God. It's making the blind see. And that's what is amazing about grace. That's why the song Amazing Grace is one of the most powerful hymns of all time. Uh, what's the first verse? What's the very first verse that we remember? I butchered it in the nine. I'm going to say it the right way this time. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was what? Blind. But now I see. See, church, this is the gospel. You were blind, but now you see. 
Why couldn't the Pharisees believe that Jesus is the light of the world? Because you can't see light when you're blind. You can try your best to explain the miracles to the Pharisees and say, look, look at another miracle that Jesus did. Can't you believe? But their hearts were blind to the truth. And the only way that that they could look at what Jesus said and believe in his works and his miracles was a heart change. And that's why salvation and believing the gospel is a heart change. It's moving away from darkness and into the light. It's moving away from blindness to sight that we can see and that we can hear. This is why John, over and over again, John's going, he who has ears, let him hear. He's not talking to a people that literally don't have ears. He's talking to people that are deaf toward the things of God. He's like, no, for us to see and hear, we have to have a transformation of the heart. And just as true as that was in in Jesus' day with the Pharisees, it is absolutely true today. That you can talk to your non-Christian family members, your non-Christian friends, and you can say, man, I want to explain to you why Christianity makes so much sense. And you can say, I want to show you all the great apologetic books that show the reliability of the Bible and show the historical accuracy of Jesus. And I'm going to show you pictures of Israel. And I'm going to show you, here's a, here's a picture of the empty tomb where people think that Jesus was resurrected. And here's all the places that Jesus walked. Here's all the early churches we can try to show and prove. Here's all the big archaeological digs. And I can show you um, how many um, uh, copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls that we have to prove to you that Jesus is Real, but listen, without a heart change, it will make no difference whatsoever. Like, I'm not saying don't pursue those things. Absolutely pursue those things. But without a heart change, it will make no difference whatsoever. People saw miracles right in front of Jesus and still refused to believe. So don't get into the trap of making faith sound reasonable. Can I just tell you it doesn't sound reasonable? Is that okay? Like Paul opens up in 1 Corinthians with these words, talking to a group of people in Corinth who are trying to make sense of Christianity in a dark place. And Paul just right out of the gate. He says, 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of, of the cross is folly. Some of your translations says foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the what? The power of God. He's saying it's It's folly to the world around us. You have to have new eyes to believe this. That's what makes faith faith, right? So there's nothing reasonable about Christianity, honestly. If we try to get down to the grassroots, here's what I mean by this. It's not reasonable to say a child can be born of a virgin, right? That's not reasonable, people in the medical world, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's, it's not reasonable to say that he grew up as a child and never sinned. Do you have children? We know that this is not possible to grow up as a teenager and never sin. Do you have teenagers? A college student who's never sinned. I don't know if he's went to college, but I'm just saying he was younger. He's in his 20s. Never sinned. All the way up in his 30s. Never sinned. He was perfect and sinless. And then Jesus Christ, who was innocent, died for the sins of the world. There's nothing reasonable about that. And Jesus, who died on the cross, was buried. A giant, massive rock was thrown in the way. And three days later, he burst forth from the grave. And he conquered the penalty of Satan's sin and death. There's nothing reasonable about that. The people around Jesus, after And hundreds and thousands of years after that we have heard this message and believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sin and put our faith in that truth, now our lives will be transformed from the inside out. We'll be new people. And then we'll be filled with his Holy Spirit, which is the um, ongoing presence of Christ in our life until we meet him. There's nothing reasonable about that. So what causes us to believe I hope I'm not making you not believe today. But what causes you to believe? Because somewhere in your story, just as Saul heard from God, God stopped you dead in your tracks, say, hey, this life ain't working for you anymore. Like all your tricks to try to um, make yourself a better person and you trying to white-knuckling life, yeah, it didn't work anymore. Um, you heart change. 
and you need to surrender your life to me, and you need to give me your heart so I can change it and give it back to you and fill you with the Spirit. And by believing in Christ and my, in his finished work, that's what's going to make you a new person. And then you're, whoa, my eyes are open. And there's something that happens with us even after our eyes are open. What happens? We begin to read the Bible, and we go, wow, that makes sense to me now. It didn't make sense to me before. And what happens when we have new eyes? We begin to think about our neighbors that don't know Christ. We say, man, I'm kind of worried about that person and where they're at with Jesus. I'm kind of worried about my friend and where they're at with Jesus. Man, I have a heart to spread the good news of Christ. I have the heart to fight sin. There's sin in my life that I wasn't even aware of. Why are you aware of it all of a sudden? Because Jesus gave you new eyes. You were once blind. You were in the darkness. But when Jesus gave you a new life, you're now walking in the light, and you're exposed to his truth, and you want more of it. You don't want to remain in the darkness. And that's the good news of the gospel. And so maybe some of you are here this morning and you're struggling to believe. Maybe you're finding yourself skeptical toward the things of God. I get it. I'm, I'm, I get it, friend. And maybe you're just thinking, man, if I just knew enough information, I could, could finally believe. Friend, the people that saw Jesus' miracles take place right in front of him, yet they struggled to believe. What does it take? Perhaps this morning you could just stop trying to speculate and get the right answer to believe. Maybe it's just, God, remove the scales from my eyes so I could see. Remove the sin that is causing me not to see the gospel clearly because he's the one who saves, not you. You can't save yourself. You gotta ask him, you gotta ask him to bring the light of the gospel into the darkness of your soul. And that's the prayer of what it means to save a person. It's just an invitation, God, Show me the light of the gospel that I might believe. So that's for you this morning. If you're not a believer, if you're hearing online and you're not a believer and you're hearing this, ask Jesus to remove the scales from your eyes so that you can see clearly. For those of us who do believe, there's something really awesome here in the ta- text that I don't want us to leave with, that I do want us to leave with, sorry. I don't want us to leave without. There it is, verse seven. After this man was healed, look at what happens. Jesus said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And so he went and he washed and he came back seeing. And later on in the verses, if you continue to read, this man goes into the street and he begins to tell people that he was once blind, but now he can see. And this man who now can see is now sent. I love that. Throughout these two chapters in John 8 and John 9, there are 10 times where Jesus uses this language of being sent. You see him saying he's sent by the Father in chapter 8, verse 12, in chapter 8, verse 16, in chapter 8, verse 18, in chapter 8, verse 26, in chapter 8, verse 29, in chapter 8, verse 42. And then in chapter 9, verse 4, he says the same thing. And then in chapter 9, verse 7, he's saying, go and be sent to the pool, which, and wash in the pool, which means sent. I love that. Because he's saying, Jesus is saying, as I am sent by the Father to bring light into the world, those of you who are no longer blind, you too are sent. That your job as a believer in Jesus for someone who was blind but now sees, you are now sent. And friends, this is us, that we are now, because we see, we get to go into the world with the light of the gospel, filled with the Holy Spirit, and we get to push back darkness. And this is why the gospel of Jesus Christ is a testimony that we were once uh, blind, but now we see, but it's also an announcement that we can see, that we have light, and you too who are blind, you can have light. That you can see this through all the, throughout all the Bible with the church. That Paul, um, you even see Paul in, in Corinth when people are often struggling with the culture around them and how to make much of Christ to the culture around them. You see it in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5. He says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Church, hear me. If you're wondering what in the world, how will your neighbors know Jesus? Maybe you're sitting there going, I don't, I don't feel equipped to share the gospel with my neighbors or my coworkers. I, I don't feel like I'll have the right answers or I'll make sense of the difficult questions that they may ask or the opposition that they may have toward Christianity. Or maybe you feel like, man, my life doesn't measure up enough to have the authority to even tell someone about Jesus. But listen, Jesus does not disqualify the blind man. The only qualification for him to be sent is to see. 
Can you see? Then you're sent. So listen, what it means to share the gospel is to share with the world that you were blind and now you see. And that's what the blind man did. And that's the goal for us, church. We see, now we're sent. And so church, if you want to be sent, the first question is, do you see? Have you been transformed by the gospel? Then go and share that truth. And then we are then image bearers of Christ. We get to go, as Paul says, shine the light, uh, let the light shine out of the darkness. That's what the church does and we're sent. So if you see, you were sent. And we're sent to Winterville and Greenville and throughout the world. And that's why we as a church, we say our mission is to mature and multiply believers to leave a gospel legacy. And what that means is we don't have to be Bible scholars to go and share. We just have to see. So if you see, you are sent. And that's the good news of the gospel. God help us. Let's pray. Father, God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. We're grateful, Lord, that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, that he came into the darkness so that we can see him clearly. So God, I pray first for those who are here, who are lost in spiritual darkness. Maybe they're consistently lost in their own sin. And maybe when they even hear the word of God, it doesn't penetrate. It doesn't move their hearts. God, may, may your spirit break through. Maybe you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear. Maybe you humble them and draw them to you. And Lord, even as we just read, maybe something like scales would remove from their eyes so that they would see you clearly and they would humble themselves and repent of their sins and to trust you. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would do that, Lord, to bring the light into the darkness of their souls that they would, might see you clearly and they might walk in the light. And God, I pray, Lord, for those of us who believe, as you tell us in your word in 1 John, you say that we are to walk in the light as you are in the light. And your word tells us that if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with you and we have fellowship with each other. So God, I pray right now for those who are not currently walking in the light. Maybe they've experienced life and death and they've seen transformation. They were once in the darkness and now they're in the light, but maybe there's a temptation to stay go back to the darkness. Maybe they want to hide sin. and Maybe they don't want to walk in repentance. God, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would soften their hearts this morning, soften our hearts this morning. And may we walk in the light as you are in the light. Because when we walk in the light, we experience freedom. And there is no freedom in the darkness. So God, I pray, Lord, as we do that, Lord, that we would see ourselves as we see that we would also be sent and know that, that we would go into the places that you would have us, whether it be in our neighborhoods or our workplaces or our classrooms, that we would be the light of the gospel to other people so they might see Christ clearly. And so God, I pray that right now as we respond, that you would just do your work, move mightily in our hearts now to walk towards the light and not stay in the darkness. In Jesus' good name, amen.